if a pilot is, uh, is flying around the curve of the Earth, then it sh he should be dipping the nose down um, every, every five minutes. He should be dipping the nose down to, to stay around the curve. But the thing that really um, uh, got me interested was, as you say, the gyroscope. In, in a plane, there is a, um, an artificial horizon, okay, and it's based on a gyroscope. And if you spin a gyroscope um, on a surface, it will want to stay upright. You can twist and tilt the surface as much as you like, the gyroscope will stay upright. So, if a plane has a gyroscope, and it starts um, following the curve of the Earth, mm. the gyroscope would stay upright, which mm. means your, the uh, um, artificial horizon will start to, to roll backwards. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's absolute proof that a plane flies over a flat surface rather than a curved one. Because um, I asked the pilot um, on my last flight, uh, you know, does, do you ever notice the, the, auto, um, the artificial horizon? Uh, rolling backwards. He said, no, no, but the artificial horizon has complex electronics in it to, to make sure it knows where it is on the earth and it compensates. But I went to um, the manufacturer of the artificial horizon and they confirmed to me that it's completely mechanical, nothing electronic in it at whatsoever. So it's, it's literally just a gyroscope that can freely move. So that right there is proof to me that um, you know, planes fly over a plane. None of it makes sense. The, the problem is that we're taught as children, um, you know, uh, this, this ball earth lie. And, um, you know, you might ask as a child, you know, um, what about the people in Australia? You know, they're standing on the bottom of the globe, won't they fall off? And your teacher says, no, no, gravity. And you go, oh, okay. And you never, never go back to that question. But when you go back to it as an adult, and start looking at it with a critical eye, right, the whole thing falls apart. As you say, the, the globe is, is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a um, leading astronomer in America, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, bitch, tells us that, that the Earth is not a perfect circle, it is actually an oblate spheroid, it's squashed mm -hmm. and, uh, and wider at the equator. Yeah. So, Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning, and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere, it's, an, it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Yeah. So my question to him would be, why is there land at the equator? Because um, water will move more readily than rock. So if the earth is spinning, the water will be um, collected at the equator. I mean, if you spin a wet um, tennis ball, okay, you spin a wet tennis ball, the water shoots off. Mm -hmm at the equator, essentially. So all the water will be um, gathered around the equator. So why is there land at the equator? Doesn't make any sense. Um, the other thing that's uh, about s the spinning Earth is looking at the stars. Now, um, directly above the axis of spin is the pole star, Polaris, okay? Um, directly over the North Pole. And um, we're told that the reason that all the stars spin around the, uh, the, the North Star is because the, the Earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour, okay? Seems to make sense because if you put a long exposure camera uh, pointing at the North Star, you'll see um, the stars will make perfect circles around, perfect star trails. The only problem is the, um, the Earth is also orbiting the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, okay? The sun is moving, dragging the Earth and all the, all the planets up that way or that way um, at 600,000 miles an hour. So why do we see perfect circles, you know? Because that's the slowest speed, <laughs> that's um, uh, slowest motion in that, in that mix. 
and, and yet the, the Earth is moving 67 times faster that way and 600 times faster that way. So you should see the stars do all sorts of strange mo um, motions, but you don't. You only see them make these perfect circles. That tells me that it's the stars that are moving, not the Earth. The, the thing is, what, what the scientists will give you is calculations and, uh, you know, and theories why that happens. But we have experience. We, we see things and they m either make sense or they don't make sense. And what the, the scientists do is substitute our, our common sense and our intuition for calculations and theory. And we're supposed to believe the calculations rather than what we experience uh, ourselves. Um, there was a famous experiment back in the 1800s in England uh, called the Bedford Levels Experiment. Now, the Bedford Levels is a, a canal that uh, is perfectly straight for six miles. Okay? So what um, a chap called Samuel Rowbottom did was he took a telescope, put it in the water about eight inches above the water, and he had a friend, yeah, um, had a friend in a rowboat with a flag on the back, row all the way to the other end and he was able to see the uh, the flag on the back of the rowboat the whole distance now according to spherical um, trigonometry um, the curve of the earth is eight inches per mile squared so um, over five miles um, that's um, five times 525 um, times eight which is 200 which is works out, that's 200 inches, which works out at 16 feet. That means the boat should have been 16 feet below the horizon. He shouldn't have been able to see the boat. Now, um, you know, the scientists will say, oh, refraction and this and light bending around the earth and stuff. Um, but, but the fact is, you know, it was, it's perfectly flat. And, and he, he, in his book, he's, uh, he, he puts forward many, many arguments that show that, or many, many experiments that show the Earth is always perfectly flat. They say they, that you see the, uh, the mast you know, lo go down last. It's, it's literally just the way your, your vision works. Yeah? It's perspective and, and atmospherics, basically. Um, the, you, the limit of your vision is supposedly three miles. And then after three miles, you're supposed to see the, the boat start to uh, go over the horizon. It's funny that Neil deGrasse Tyson, again, says that, um, explains that you can't see uh, the curvature of the Earth from a plane. He says this. You can't see the curvature of the Earth from a plane because you're not high enough. The Earth is so big that um, you can't get high enough to see the curvature. Yet, you can apparently see a boat go over the curvature. Over, th over the distance of three miles, which doesn't make sense. The thing is, when you, when you um, look out and you see a boat start to go over the horizon, if you suddenly get a pair of binoculars and look, it comes back again. And once it goes out of the sight of your binoculars, if you get a telescope, yeah, it comes back again. It doesn't go over any, any, any curve of the horizon. What we found, um, many people have done experiments with uh, very high-powered zoom um, cameras and they, they've watched a boat go sail out to sea and they've just kept trained on this, on this boat. And what they see is, after a, a very long distance, you see an atmospheric effect where um, the bottom of the boat disappears and, starts, and, and the top of the boat inverts, so you see a sort of mirror image. And that, um, with your eyesight, you know, you, basically the bottom of the boat just melts into the... Uh, into the horizon. One of the best examples of that is the um, Antwerp Notre Dame, Notre Dame Spire, which can be seen something like 240 kilometers away from, uh, you know, from the spire. So um, that should be over a mile below the horizon, and you can still see it. Um, there's been a few famous examples uh, just recently of uh, a man who took a picture across the Great Lakes from Michigan and was able to see, I believe it's Chicago. Um, which he shouldn't have been able to see, and the uh, yeah, and the news, uh, the television um, station basically said it was a mirage. This is from Joshua Nowicki, and what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake that we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. Um, Thank you.
<laughs> they always say it's a mirage, but um, for a mirage to happen, you have to have very specific atmospheric um, conditions. And there have been so many people who have seen exactly the same thing on different days, different seasons, um, always the same. Um, you know, it's not a mirage, it's simply that you, you know, you're, you're looking across a plane. You see in a kind of pyramid shape, yeah? you, you, you have a horizon at your eye level, and everything above the horizon um, will go down into the horizon. Yeah? Everything below the horizon will, will seem to go up. Just like if you look in, you're in a long hallway, you'll see that the, the walls will start to move in and the roof and the, and the floor will start to move into to the centre. Yeah? So literally, um, between you and the object you're looking at, there's all sorts of, uh, of things sort of like waves going up and down. And while you can't see them, if they're beyond the limit of your sight, they're still, sometimes they can still obscure what you're looking at. Um, but it's just because they're between you and it. And um, it's just the way, it's literally perspective. Um, um, especially if I could uh, draw a, a diagram, but uh, it's a very difficult uh, subject to, to get your head around if you're not used to it. Um, but it is perspective. Um, one, one sort of other proof is um, there's a place in Bolivia called um, Salar de Uyuni, which is a, a salt flat. It's literally 100 miles um, wide one way and 80 miles across. And it's perfectly flat. And when it rains, um, literally uh, you get an inch of water and it looks like a perfect mirror. Um, now, how does that happen on a, on a, on a, a, a sphere? Yeah, it shows you that you know, if you're one end of this, this salt flat, you can see perfectly clearly the other end, 100 miles away. Um, so it's just showing you that uh, you know, um, the, the Earth is flat. And um, without the effect of the waves in the sea, you, you, you'd be able to see um, a whole lot further. If you were to go to NASA and download one of their photos of the Earth in the moon sky, and put it in Photoshop, okay, um, drop the saturation and the, the levels down, you'll see that uh, the Earth is, has been pasted in because you'll see a rectangular box around the, the Earth. It's, it's all fraud, it's all fake. Um, pretty much everything NASA puts out is, is fraudulent. There are, there, are no, there are no images of Earth um, from space. Uh, the only one that NASA actually claims is a photograph it was from 1972, and it's the, the famous picture. It's got, um, it's got Africa sort of near the top, and it's the, the same picture they've been using for, for the last 40 or 50 years um, in every textbook. Um, every other image is, a, is what they call a composite. It's Photoshop. There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. but. I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. And um, many of us have been looking at these these images of Earth, um, including the one they call the big blue marble which is, was released in 2002, I think. Um, again, when you zoom into it with Photoshop, you'll see where they've, they've used the clone tool in Photoshop to take a picture of one, one of the clouds and stamp it in various places around the, around the, the, the picture. And they got lazy. Um, in, in another image, they've even Photoshopped the word sex in the clouds which is a subliminal uh, tool they use to get people to, to sort of relate to um, something. They literally, you can look at this and um, you can find it on, on NASA's website. In a video I'm, um, I'm working on at the moment, I've got a um, video from what they call the Galileo um, Space Probe 
as it left Earth, it, it took a series of shots of Earth, apparently. Um, and you see that uh, over the course of 25 hours, um, the clouds never move. Okay. Now, I've, I happen to find um, some pictures of um, satellite pictures of Earth. And I noticed that in these separately taken satellite shots, the clouds were exactly the same as the ones in, the, um, in this Galileo shot. So it's a cloud map. It would be very simple indeed to just um, silence everybody, um, you know, put an end to this topic once and for all, turn the Hubble round and show us um, Earth in real time, zooming in onto a, a place so that we can see what's happening at that place and, and we know that there is something up there looking down on us um, um, from space. But they will not do it. They can't do it. It, 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 can't, it doesn't exist. It literally doesn't exist. When you go onto the plane tracking software, um, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of flights over the, uh, over the northern hemisphere. Um, and you can track those flights from beginning to end. When you look at any flight in the, in the southern hemisphere, what you'll find is the, uh, the flight takes off and disappears off the tracking, um, usually about an hour after takeoff. And then later on, will reappear an hour before landing. Um, now, there's no explanation for it. I mean, the, the, the point is that um, distances are very different, and distances and, and, and flight plans are very different on the flat Earth than they are on the ball. Um, and when you look at flights in the southern hemisphere, they, they make some really crazy, um, you know, sort of deviations. So, for instance, if we look on, on here, um, let's say a flight from Cape Town Cape Town over here to Australia, say, say Sydney and Australia, they will, they will take you to Dubai first, somewhere around here, yes. Just recently there was um, a case of a, a woman who uh, was pregnant on a flight and she, she was about, to, her waters broke on the flight. And I think it was from the Philippines to, um, to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And um, again, if you look, uh, if you look on this, this map, you're from around here somewhere to, to here, okay? Now, they were flying across and, and literally um, she, her waters broke and they had to divert, they had to land. So instead of either going back to the Philippines or going on to uh, Los Angeles, they went, they landed in Alaska. <laughs> Which again, if you look on the, uh, on the flat map, it's again a, a straight path. Santiago, Chile to, to uh, uh, Australia mm -hmm. right, will, will usually stop in Los Angeles. Again, you can see on the flat map that it's again a straight path. It all seems to make sense and, uh, and if um, the only thing that would, uh, would sort of confirm it or disprove it would be GPS. But, you know, I hope GPS doesn't work in the, south, um, in the south and southern hemisphere. This is, a, this is a, um, an issue because um, there, there have been a few people who said they've taken flights that have taken only 14 hours and they've, um, they're direct flights from Australia to, um, to South America. Mm -hmm. um, now, somebody has actually um, redrawn the flat map to take, in, um, take into account these, uh, um, you know, the, the distances, and apparently the distances work out. I haven't seen the map myself, um, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I should be looking further into it. But, um, yes, uh, up, until, up until these people came forward, and, again, I, I haven't seen any real evidence that they have taken these flights. They, they told me they've taken these flights. But um, who, can, who knows? They can, they can actually... Um, advertise a flight that's uh, direct, you know, they can price it out of the range of uh, most people to, to take, and then if anybody does um, take it, they could cancel it. I, I don't think any flights actually fly directly over the, south, the North Pole at all. I think they, they skirt the North Pole, mm -hmm. but um, I don't think they fly directly over the, the actual pole. So I don't know if it's uh, to do with magnetics. The only thing I do know is that nothing flies um, over the South Pole. Um, because, again, on a flat map, the, the South Pole, the, 
uh, at continent of Antarctica is the ring around the Earth. So, you know, you can't fly over the, over the ring um, and, uh, and get anywhere. That's why we're not allowed to go there. I mean, think about it. It's the only treaty that's, that's uh, you know, uh, all these countries have signed and never broken and uh, uh, completely agreed on. It's the only one. And, you know, what, what treaty is there that everybody's agreed on? Um, we're, we're being kept away from it for a reason. You know, they have some scientific bases there, yeah, and, and literally it's controlled by the military. If you try and, uh, and go there by yourself, you will be uh, um, sort of picked up and uh, escorted back. Uh, there was a guy called Jarls Anderhoy who tried to, uh, to take a mission to, to the Antarctica and he was, he was picked up and, uh, and taken back by the military. Um, it's a good reason because they don't want you finding out what's, what's beyond. Admiral Byrd, actually, he actually Admiral. did four, four um, expeditions. Uh -huh. and, um, and most of them were military expeditions with huge military groups. Um, you know, th uh, thousands of people, you know, planes, boats, the, the works. Um, and, and yes, he confirms in an in a interview that he discovered uh, a land, a continent, as big as the continental United States out there that was um, with, with warm water lakes and, and mountains and everything uh, that was completely uninhabited and he said and he described it as the other side of the South Pole to middle America so um, on, the, on the globe that means it would be somewhere in the Indian, Indian Ocean there's a huge continent that nobody knows about so um, so yeah, there's, um, there's more going on than meets the eye. The other thing is, after Admiral Byrd came back after his last um, expedition, um, Antarctica was sealed off, and both America and um, you know, the, the, the Russians started firing nuclear missiles straight up. Um, now, in America, that was, that was called uh, uh, Project um, Operation Fishbowl, and it came under something called Project Dominic. Well, fishbowl makes, you know, makes sense because uh, it seems like Admiral Byrd found the edge of the dome, mm -hmm. okay, um, while he was out there. And as soon as he left there, they started firing missiles straight up, I believe, to try and test how far that, that dome went. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the, uh, the um, footage of these explosions, what you'll see is an explosion, well, when, a, when a, a bomb goes off in mid-air, it's a fireball. It expands in all directions and mostly up, okay? Now, if you look at these um, explosions on um, Operation Fishbowl, they explode outwards in a ring, which means it's, be, it's exploding against something because it can't rise with the heat. So it's exploding against something and exploding outwards, okay? And the middle of the explosion, you'll see it's, it, it glows, you know, hot, and then it cools over time. So it looks to me like they were exploding against a dome. Now, I said it was um, Operation Fishbowl, obviously Fishbowl, but the, um, uh, there's a chap called Rob Skiba who's, who discovered that the Project Dominic, the word Dominic means of the Lord. Fishbowl of the Lord. <laughs> so they, I, I believe they clearly know that we're in a, an enclosed system and um, Admiral Byrd found the edge, and they've, they've tested to see mm -hmm. um, how far it goes up. They will also say that if a sniper is, um, you know, is trying to hit something a, a great distance, a couple of miles away, um, they have to take into consideration the spinning of the earth, because they say that as the bullet leaves the muzzle of the gun, mm -hmm. it's now um, independent of the rotation of the earth, so you know, the earth will spin away from where the bullet, and you have to take it, that into account. They say that about artillery shells as well, that it's not true. Um, if, if that was true, um, a sniper would have to spend ages and ages calculating how to, to, to make that shot, and they don't. They literally take into consideration the wind and, um, and you know, the, the elevation, and they don't take um, the Coriolis effect into, into consideration at all. Um, also, planes, if, if that works for, for bullets, if bullets, as soon as they leave the earth, they're now independent of the spin, then why doesn't it work for planes? 
Yeah? Um, there's a, a video on YouTube that actually tries to explain um, that uh, the Coriolis effect works by using the, the um, example of a paper plane. You have to throw it, if you throw it north, the, uh, the, the earth will spin and the, the plane will land sort of, uh, you know, east. Um, but if you take the idea of a real plane, you know, a plane would have to aim north to go east in that case. But it, that's not what happens. And uh, if that was the case as well, um, planes would have to land on runways that are moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that would be impossible. But how is it that you can take a flight from London to, to New York and it would take exactly the same time as a flight from New York to London? Yeah? Um, one's with the spin of the planet and the other one's against it. So it does, again, doesn't make sense. Um, they'll say that uh, the whole atmosphere is moving yeah, um, with, the, with the planet, but that doesn't make sense either because um, you know, the atmosphere, say it's, it's that thick, the top layer of the atmosphere will be moving slow and uh, the, the as far, the further you get in will be moving faster. Um, so, you know, how, if everything is moving like that, how do you get a, a, a light breeze that, uh, that, go, that blows against the spin of the planet? You know, um, how do you get a, a breeze that goes from north to south? It just doesn't make sense. And, and again, science will give you calculations and, and uh, you know, esoteric ideas, but uh, you, know, you can go out and look for yourself and, uh, and you'll, see, you know, you'll see what makes sense and what doesn't. The, the